Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So if you haven't yet, hit that subscribe button and turn on your post notifications so that you know every time I post a new video. Hey guys, welcome back to my YouTube channel. So today I have the 2020 communication studies paper. And I guess for this video, I'll just tell you, give you guys the tips that were asked for asked for in like my DMs and stuff. And some of you messaged me on WhatsApp. So I'll just give you the um, rundown, like the list of tips that I used when I was doing my exam and actually go through the paper. So firstly, for the questions one to seven, your examiner will read um, an extract sent by CXC and uh, you know maybe some of you who already did like your spanish exam or your french exam is expecting like a cd because that's what you got to do your paper when you got to listen to a cd but for this your examiner or the invigilator for the examination will read the extract to you and then you answer questions one to seven Firstly, you will get the opportunity to look at the questions before the examiner reads the the extract to you twice. So my first tip is to use that to your advantage and figure out what are the answers that you'll be listening for while the examiner reads the extract. Now, secondly, try to understand the extract and not try to um retain or memorize um, the words from the extract right and that's why my first tip i'm going back to that where i said um to use the, the you getting to read the questions first uh, um, to your advantage by looking for by knowing what you're supposed to be looking for in the um extract no, the 2020 extract that we got was a piece of the poem, a poem, I Rise, um, by Maya Angelou. No, I'll just read it. So pause the video. Um, I guess look at the questions. Look at question seven. I had to scroll down a bit for you to see that. But yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. And then unpause the video and then, you know, listen to the extract and try to come up with the answers. Now remember, um, CXC doesn't really send answer sheets unless you're looking at what we call the mark scheme and that's for paper twos, right? Or the student reports and that's only good for like um, reading subjects or um, subjects that require a lot of writing. So, yeah. So if you think like one of the answers that I have here, you would put something else, you can always um, say that down in the comments and we can have like a discussion about it. And for like educational channels, guys, it's always great to look in the comments while watching the video or after watching the video to see what other people are saying. And seeing that you're taking a Caribbean examination, that's the best place to hear from, hear different voices from the Caribbean, right? the the comment section because i'm just jamaican so i can only speak for the jamaican voice and not every jamaican has the same view because we're all different people right so let's get to it now this is the the poem or the piece you may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies you may tread me in the very dust but still like dust i rise that should have been, you may tread me in the very dirt. So let me just start over. Sorry. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may tread me in the very dirt, but still like dust I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes? Shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a day daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Now that was the first reading, and you're supposed the examiner is supposed to read it twice. So I'm going to read it again, right? You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lies. You may tread me in the very dirt, but still like dust I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, 
Shoulders falling like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise into, the, into a daybreak that's wondrously clear. I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Okay, so number one asks us which of the following describe the tone used in the poem? A, bitterness and rage. B, hope and excitement. C, disgust and resentment. D, affirmation and triumph. Now, my third tip is whenever you're doing multiple choice quest um, questions, what you want to do is not look for the correct answer. Wait, that may sound like a contradiction. Of course, you want to get want to get the question right. But what I mean is don't look for what the answer you think is the or, or especially for like um, exams like English literature and literatures in English. Is that what's, what it's called in Cape? I don't even know. Um, Caribbean studies and communication studies. What you want to do is look for the best or the most suitable answer for the question asked. You want to treat every question as its own thing or its own individual question rather than treating it as one whole paper, right? Your goal is to get each question correct at a time, all right? So bitterness and rage. Now the, per the poet or the writer doesn't really seem bitter, right? Or maybe they are and the but they don't seem angry to the point of rage that's just not the tone of the piece hope and excitement perhaps it's a bit hopeful but not not the person isn't excited at all and you can tell disgust and resentment perhaps disgust but resentment seems a bit bitter and there isn't really a tone of bitterness so affirmation and triumph i would say that's the best suited answer for this question because the per the poet or the person or the writer, whatever you want to say, is saying, despite all that you did to me, I overcame that and I rose above it. And I am who I am now because I overcame the, oppres the oppression or the uh, oppressive actions towards me. So that's why I would have chosen D. Now, number two, the main purpose of the poem is to A, affirm the progress that was made during slavery. D, inspire courage among the descendants of the enslaved. C, encourage readers to show much respect for their ancestors. D, to encourage readers to face life fiercely and courageously. Now, when I did this, I was torn between A and B. But... I don't know. I would have chose. I let me tell you why I would choose A. No, the poem doesn't ref refer. The poem is talking to the oppressors. I got that much, right? The poem is directed at oppressors, and we can tell that um, from the lines that were were rhetorical questions. Did you want to see me broken? bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries. Those were all questions, right? And then the, per the, the, the writer goes on to tell them that they are leaving all of that behind them and they are rising from it, right? So that's what I got from it. So that's why I would say it's affirming the progress that was made during slavery. Or what I'm getting from it is you actually emerging from, you know, hardship and oppression, leaving behind slavery. So that's progress, right? So number three, the use of the word daybreak in the poem best conveys a sense of optimism, expectancy, and a clarity of purpose. Number four, which of the following devices are evident in the lines leaving behind the nights of terror and fear? I rise into a daylight that's wondrously clear. Now, first of all, the backslash, the forward slashes, I don't know why I said backslashes. The forward slashes 
are to show division of lines. So leaving behind the nice of terror and fear is one line. The next line is I rise. And then the line after that is into a daylight that's wondrously clear. No. A is metaphor contrast rhyme. B metaphor repetition rhyme. There is no in the lines given that we're supposed to pay attention to. There is no repetition. Of course, there's repetition in the poem itself, where the the poet constantly repeats, "I rise, I rise, I rise." And then you have juxtaposition, imagery, and rhythm. No, I'll get to that in a second. Juxtaposition, alliteration, and rhythm. No, there's no alliteration. So I'm torn between A and C. And that's how you want to do multiple choice questions. You want to focus on what's not the answer first before you focus on what's the answer. Like eliminate what you're dead sure about. That's not the answer. That's not the answer. Right? Then try to figure out what is the answer. All right. So the first thing is metaphor versus juxtaposition now juxtaposition is similar to contrast but the main difference is that whatever is being compared they're put side side by side or right next to each other so let's say you have two words like um a wet blanket versus a dry desert right you want to put wet and dry together so or the whatever is being contrasted together so right after saying the wet blanket is on the table in the dry desert desert oh my god desert in the dry desert that would be juxtaposition because the contrast is being placed beside each other no in the lines given leaving behind nights of terror and fear i rise into a daylight that's wondrously clear i rise divides the con the the two things that are being contrasted the nights of terror and fear into daylight right those are what those two things are what um are being compared so they are divided by i rise therefore they're not placed immediately next to each other that's why i would not have chosen juxtaposition so that's why I say A is the answer metaphor and contrast, metaphor, contrast, and rhyme. Because fear and clear, and per perhaps there's more rhyming there, but I'm not looking for that. That's what stood out to me, fear and clear. Okay, so metaphor, contrast, as opposed to juxtaposition and rhyme. So for number four, A. Number five, the rhetorical questions, did you want to see me broken? Head bowed with lowered eyes are used in the poem to A, suggest the persona's defiance, convey the, pers the persona's depression, C, evoke confidence and determination, or D, to appeal to the oppressor's sen sense of sympathy. All right. First of all, A and B are out. C, to evoke confidence and determination, or D, to appeal to the, opp the oppressor's sense of sympathy. All right, I would not have chosen D because appealing to the oppressor's sense of sympathy kind of sounds like, hey, you're begging them to realize what they have done is wrong. But that's not what the person is doing. The person is telling them that, hey, you did this to me, but guess what? I am not phased. I am better. I am better than I was before. I did not let what you did to me hold me back. So I think it's to play the confidence, the affirmation, the triumph in the piece and the determination to getting ahead, you know, or getting towards what we had said is the clarity of purpose. The clarity of purpose is to get ahead. So that's why I would say C, to evoke confidence and determination. But of course, you can challenge me in the comment section. I actually like answering your questions. And I have a few to answer after I finish editing this. So number six, which of the following best captures the mood of the poem? Aversion, inspiration, acceptance, or indifference? I wouldn't say acceptance or unconcern or, you know, not showing concern because that's what indifference means inspiration aversion i would go for inspiration versus instead of let's not say versus instead of aversion all right um aversion is quite similar to um 
bitterness <laughs> resentment aversion is like um a strong dislike for something so for that reason i would not have chosen aversion so that's not the answer either i say inspiration because of the whole um tone of the piece so the mood the main purpose all of that plays into the piece being one that inspires us not to like focus on our shortcomings but to to use them as a push to get ahead number seven the change from the use of the second person at the start of the poem to the use of the first person at the end is effective in conveying the speaker the speaker's bitterness about slavery attitude towards her ancestors shift in focus from past to present or freedom as a descendant of the enslaved see i think it's the shift shift the focus from past to present and to show progress okay now seeing that you have gone through questions one to seven and i do encourage you to do questions one to seven before moving to eight to 45 mainly because you'll not get an opportunity to hear the extract again so you want to do the questions while or whilst the extract is still fresh in your heads right so number eight so items eight to ten instructions Read the following scenario carefully and then answers, answer items 8 to 10. A news report indicates that citizens have been buying used cars rather than new ones. Your, your sixth form class has decided to conduct research to find out which cars people prefer and why. Now, number 8 says, which of the following would be the main advantage to the researcher if pre-coded questions were used as a method of data collection. Now, pre-coded questions are like open-ended interview questions. All right. So cost savings, obtaining confidential information, um, easy analysis of findings. And that's, let's just do D, ability to probe for further details. Now, C, ease, easy analysis of findings, A, cost saving, and um, A and C are most suited for questionnaires as advantages because questionnaires are just, you know, a give out, get back, and you can easily um, go through and sort out the answers unless you have like an open-ended um, questionnaire question, which are um, not very common. You have like actual pre made answers to questionnaires so d would be the most suitable answer to, because um, interviews give you the ability the ability to probe for further details so number nine which of the following does not reflect how an interview might be administered for this research a sending an email to a manager B, taking note of certified vehicles. C, talking with a contact over the phone. Or D, discussing preferences with consumers. Number nine, B, taking note of certified vehicles. The rest seem like plausible um, methods of getting to talk to people in, an, in a way that you would conduct an interview. Now, number 10, which of the following could be a disadvantage to the researcher if interviews were used as the method of data collection? Now, A, low rate of data return. B, difficulty making inferences. C, subjectivity of the researcher. Or D, um, limited scope to explore variables. Now, D, we can say that's not the answer because that is not an not a disadvantage of interviews, but rather an advantage. Oh, the advantage would be the opposite, right? So let me say that that's not true. D is not true, and um, the opposite would be true. 
So the by conduct by conducting an interview, your scope of exploring variables aren't aren't limited you have the opportunity to ask the questions that you want so i'd ask follow-up questions right there and then if they pop up in your head now a low rate of data return that's a disadvantage for questionnaires the use of questionnaires because you issuing questionnaires does not guarantee you get them all back okay um b difficulty maintaining making inferences sorry you shouldn't have any difficulty making inferences because again you can ask your interviewee what they mean by this if it's not clear or ask them follow-up questions or ask them to expound on what they're saying right so number 10 i would say c subjectivity of the researcher and that just um refers to the fact or um let me say an occurrence where the researcher is influenced by social um, social dynamics, um, things that are happening around them, beliefs, norms, their own beliefs, their own norms, their own values, right? And basically the own viewpoint of the researcher. Let's deal with numbers 11 to 15. And some of you probably will feel overwhelmed doing like um, so many questions at once. 45 questions is a lot. It's a bit of a cut down from 60 that the C6 students get, but still 45 is a lot. And I'm usually tired going through these papers. But what you want to do is trick yourself. Trick your brain. You, uh, it's, you can actually do that. You can trick your brain into doing things that you don't want to do. Um, how I approach these is seeing that they divide them into sections like questions 11 to 15, um was that 8 to 14 i can't count oh my god 8 to 10 right i treated those as the paper right so i just needed to get i just told myself you just need to get these three questions correct right that's all because there are three questions and you don't want to get less than one right because that's less than 50 percent well less than one is zero. Oh my god anyways so that's how I treat them. I divide them into sections, like think about them as me doing mini tests and just doing a lot of mini tests, right? So number 15 to 11 to 15 is what I want to finish now. So at a recent meeting with the principal of Mansfield High School, the Ministry of Education revealed that a check of the most recent census documents showed that some senior students of the school have been irregularly attending classes. The ministry decides to hire a research company to investigate the likely reasons for students' irregular attendance. Now, they want to check out the senior students who are attending classes irregularly. Number 11, which of the following sources could provide the most useful information to help the researchers to identify the sample? Form teachers, class registers, C, class monitors, or D, student reports. You want to use the class registers if you want to um, check up on attendances. Of course, you could ask the form teachers, but they probably don't have that information in their head. Hence why they are required to take, you know, a class register. Number 11, um, 12, which of the following must the research company consider when selecting a sample? Accuracy of the census documents, the average number of respondents, how well the population is represented, or how knowledge, knowledgeable the respondents are. Now, you don't need this because we're just checking. Um, we want to see why senior students, some students, senior students are attending classes irregularly. Um, the average number of respondents, nope. Um, the accuracy of the census documents. This doesn't really matter if the population itself isn't represented properly because um, what is meant by the population being represented um, well is that, all right, for example, you wouldn't want to have, a, a, um, let's say there are 25 students in a class, and uh, let's talk about one senior class for now. Now, there are 25 students in a senior class, and 20 of them attend classes quite frequently, quite regularly, have like flaw a flawless a flawless attendance record and five students right five students attend very poorly now 
you want to do the research on those five students who attend classes irregularly to find out why they attend classes irregularly, right? So having like a sample size of 20 students who actually attend a class regularly wouldn't be a proper representation of the, um, the population or the sample. Now, number 13 says, if the research company used observation as a method of collecting data, which of the following could be an advantage? Predicting the behavior to be observed, um, directly witnessing the behavior of the participants, spending an extended period of time collecting data, or participants changing um, their behavior while being observed. Now we want to look for advantages, and this definitely does not sound like an advantage. Um, C doesn't sound like an advantage either, so you want to think about A and B. And I think the most suitable answer for this would be B, so they would get some amount of subjectivity to the research, so they'll be able to directly witness the behaviors of the participants, see why they don't come, see if they don't come, see if they do come, right? Number 14, if the research company only collected data in the morning, which of the following could adversely affect the validity of the, resu the results? Oh my God. One, adequacy of the data. Two, reliability of the data. Um, representativeness of the sample. If they only took... Um, they only collected data in the morning. They wouldn't know the stu know how many students actually attend classes in the afternoons. Of course, you get supposed to get a break like lunchtime, and then after that, you have your afternoon classes. Most schools do that. Um, but if they only say collect data in the morning, they won't know really what comes up. Who does attend classes in the afternoon? So that would um affect the adequacy of the data so it probably would have be um an insufficient amount of data therefore not very reliable or concurrent and the representativeness of the sample would also be um a bit affected so i'd say all three all right so number 15 which of the following is most likely which of the following is the most likely population for this study? Students of the Mansfield High School who attend classes irregularly, senior students of Mansfield High School who attend classes irregularly, students of secondary schools in the country who attend classes irregularly, students of secondary schools in the con senior students of secondary schools in the country who attend classes irregularly. Remember, it was the principal of the Mansfield High School who actually hired this research team to find out why senior students, specifically senior students, um, who attend the school aren't attending classes regularly, right? So students overall wouldn't be a proper representation of the sample. So that leaves us with B, senior students who attend the Mansfield High School, right, who attend the classes irregularly. Number 16 to 18 refers to this thing here. This seems like a dialogue. Now, Paul says, good morning, everyone. How are you today? Samantha, me good, Paul. I'll do my football, some at me. Brian, me no feel good because Paul ever tried to chat, chat hoity-toity, speaky-spoky to it, and me no like it. Um, Paul says, Brian, I do not understand. We are all educated, so we should be speaking Caribbean standard English and not some broken language. Samantha says, yes, I'm educated, but when I chat to my friend, I have to use Caribbean standard English. After all, I don't know interview. Um, Brian says, true, Samantha, plus I don't speak no broken language. I am speaking Caribbean Creole English. No, number 16 says, when Brian accuses Paul of speaking hoity-toity in line three, Brian is suggesting that Paul is using language to assert authority, show sophistication, make um, social commentary, or discriminate against others. 
this is not D, nor is it C. So it's either to assert, assert authority or show sophistication. And I think the best answer for this is to show sophistication. Um, usually, when people are said to be speaking hoity-toity, they are um, showing how educated they are and basically they are classing society. 17. Which of the following factors would affect the dialectal varieties used by various speakers? Social class, job opportunity, religious affiliation, and intellectual capacity. Intellectual capacity um, speaks to how educated you are. So, you know, in the Caribbean, we have what we call a, con a continuum where we use the um, basilect, the mesolect, and the acrolect, where the basilect is for the, those who are of the lower class. So we can either um, include um, social class here as well. So those of the lower class or those who are less educated or what what society would deem uneducated use the basilect, while those who are just in between the middle class, you know, would use the mesolect, while those of the higher um, higher class or the upper class would use what we call the acrolect, which usually consists of um, standard English and, you know, they are well-spoken and very um, well, well, um, how should I say this? They are seem, it's not a good thing to say, but it's true. They are see, um, deemed as the more important people of society. That's, 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 just, a sad, that's just a sad reality. Um, religious affiliation, um, this could be included in people like the Rastafarian that use Yaman, Iri, um, uh, I and I, right? So right here, this question asks us, which would affect the dialect, the dialectal, um, varieties used by the various speakers and Right here, we hear them speaking mostly to the intellectual capacity or being educated, right? Because um, I think it was Paul who said we are all educated people, so we should use the whatever, the, the um, Caribbean standard English and not some broken language. Now, number 18 says, which of the speakers advocate using language as a form of identification? Now, the key word here that I didn't really see when I was like doing it, which would change my answer. I know when I was doing it, I said Paul, Samantha and Brian, but then looking at it, I see the word advocate. And I think both um, Samantha and Brian uses um, language as a form of identification to advocate um, for the, the Caribbean Creole English, right? Um, Samantha says that she is, um, what do you call it? Samantha and Brian, Samantha says that she's talking to her friends, so she doesn't need to use the Caribbean standard English. And she says, after all, I'm not doing an interview. And Brian says that she's he's not speaking any broken language. He's speaking the Caribbean Creole English. And they speak to that as them being a part of the Caribbean or citizens of the Caribbean or living in the Caribbean. So they don't need to um, speak um Caribbean standard English all the time, they can use their Creole language. So for that, I say Samantha and Brian, which means 18C. But as I said, you can contest it in the, the comment section. Now let's deal with numbers 19 to 20. 19 says, if a speaker changes his language use between Caribbean standard English and Caribbean, um, Creole English during a conversation, he would be enga engaging in code mixing, code switching, semantic substitution, semantic um, differentiation. No, it wouldn't be C or D. I don't think I need to explain what those are either. It's not the term isn't code mixing, but it is code switching. So number 19 is B. 20, which of the following Creole features is evident in the structure tangle up with his words and his feelings. Tangle up. Um, tangle up would be its um, repetition, serial verbs, reduplication, or unmarked tense. Tangle up with his um, words and feelings um, is an unmarked tense, right? 
right? Um, you don't, you're not sure if it's present past or present perfect or, you know, future. You just know that tangled up with his words and feelings. You could say he was tangled up with his words and his feelings. He is tangled up with his words and feelings. Um, he will be tangled up with his words and feelings. He tangles up. Oh, I can't say he tangles up with his words and feelings. Or can I? But I think it's unmarked tense. Hold on. Reduplication would be like chaka chaka. Um, repetition. I think that's, that's self-explanatory. All right, let's go to 20, 21 to 23. 21. Items 21 to 23. Now, mother says... Robbie, since you come back from college, all you're doing is sitting in front of that stupid computer talking to them foreign friends of yours in that high faulting voice that only you and them understand. Listen, you're home now and you and you have to behave as if you're home. So you come in to the market with me did, so you come into the market with me in the morning? Mom, Robbie says, Mother, I'm proud of how I speak, but I but I really, but do I really have to do this? I don't, I do not even remember anyone around there anymore, around here anymore. I think I should read that again. Robbie, since you come back home from college, all you're doing is sitting in front of that stupid computer talking to them foreign friend of yours in that high, high faulting voice that only you and them understand. Listen, you're home now and you have to behave as if you're home. So you're coming to the market with me tomorrow in the morning? Oh my God. Mother, I am proud of how I speak, and do I really have to do this? I do not even remember anyone around here anymore. Now, 21. Which feature of Creole English is reflected in the expression, Listen, you're home now. Listen, you're home now, and you have to behave as if you're home. Auxiliary. Reduplication. Subject adjective structure or front focusing. Um, I think it's front focusing because they want you to focus on you being home. You know, listen, you're home now, so you have to behave as if you're home. Of course, in Creole, that was said. So it's basically done to put a bit of emphasis on the word home, right? 22. Which of the following quotes from the dialogue is not an example of Creole syntax? Sitting in front of that stupid computer in that heightful high faulting language so you cut so you come into the market with me in the morning mother do i really have to do this d no 23 which of the following words describes the mother's attitude towards her son's high faulty high faulting voice scorn proud gloomy interest She's not interested, she's not proud, and I wouldn't say gloomy either. So I'd go with scorn as the best answer for this. 24 to 26 is with this. I think this was one of the most um, weird or the weirdest things I've ever read. So much left. Anyways. But see her, Miss Mary. You're not saying cherry buck up the devil own self when she when she carrying her. Plenty time that happened, you know. Remember that woman over, over all side that born the pitney with two head? Praise Jesus it did it did it did born dead. But here you did know one day she was going down the river to wash her clothes and is the devil own self she meets? Yes mm. standing right there in her way. She pop one big ball in before she faint away. And when everybody run come, not as so well see him. Is gone, he gone? But you don't know where he did gone? No right, in, no right inside that girl. Oh my God. Right in a she belly. And Miss Mary, I tell you the living truth. Just as the baby born in the midwife, no see... Now see a shadow fly out of the mother and go right across the room. She frightened so till she closed her two eyes tight and he saw the devil escape. Well, I don't know about that. 
Becky certainly don't born with no two heads or nothing wrong with her. It's just hard is she hard is then uh no so me saying Jesus I never that me get <laughs> Why? twenty four the speaker's question at the end of the extract indicates that no the speaker is who first of all I think the speaker the speaker is telling Miss Mary the story. Okay. Miss Mary did not understand the speaker. The speaker did not understand Miss Mary's statement. The speaker and Miss Mary are saying the same thing. The speaker and Miss Mary are in complete disagreement. No, no. The question at the end is said. So then uh, some is saying so Basically, the question is, another, so now that me did I say, right? So, after this speaker tells Miss Mary this long old story about devil fly up and fly out and corner room and you know what not. <laughs> yeah, that story that we just hear this speaker tell Miss Mary. Miss Mary says she don't know about the devil part of the story. But she knows that Becca and I have no devil, never born with two heads, but she had a hearing so miss the speaker says and that me did i say miss that me did i tell you so the speaker did not understand miss mary's statement no the speaker understood right hence why they said um then that me did i say the speaker and miss mary are saying the same thing this is true but the question does not indicate that you know um doesn't really indicate that they're saying the same thing even though we know that they're saying the same thing well it does indicate but what we want to see is miss mary did not understand the speaker this is more prominent right because because miss mary said well i don't know about that hold on you know i'd say see though because it wouldn't be the part then no so miss saying you know that is saying that hey the speaker did not understand well it would be the part where he said well i don't know about that becca certainly becca certainly certainly don't bow with two head and nothing wrong with her it's just that she had a hearing right that is showing that all the way the speaker just said to miss mary up there so you know miss mary did not understand and that is supported by them saying then no, that, the, the question then no that made us say but this here the question indicates that the speaker and mrs mary are saying the same thing i hope that was clear like i just i just use that uno reverse on you all so i'd say see for that 25 the sentence is well i don't know about that because certainly don't bore with two, no two head and no or nothing wrong with her in line nine present present examples of registers and code mixing code switching and zero copula code mixing and double negatives dialectal variation and code switching now where's my pen no, first of all, the answer is with code mixing, not the answer. Code mixing is whereby you mix two languages, right? To create what we call a pigeon, if I remember correctly. So mixing, an example of code mixing would be where, like, where have Chinese people, like, real prominent in Jamaica, have Chinese people um, opening supermarkets and other um, um, wholesale and retail stores, and shops um, around Jamaica and you would see them communicating with the Jamaicans by mixing the Jamaican Creole with their Chinese language right they'll be talking Chinese and then they drop into power right so that would be code mixing so A and C is out so we're left with code switching and zero copula and uh, dialectal variation and code switching and I would go I would go with d dialectal variation and code switching mostly because i didn't see a sign of zero copula and that's where um a helping verb or you know 
you know that um a helping verb should be somewhere but it's missing right so omission of b a uh, r stuff like that but i do see dialectal variation and the code switching no which of the following points on the post creole language um, continuum are represented in the speech of the characters. I would say um, Baselect and the Mesolect. And 26 kind of provides proof for the answer for 25. Number 27 to 30. Here we go. Which of the following best explains the meaning of the term lingua franca? Now, um, a lingua franca is what we call a language bridge or a language um, link where it, where it is used by different people in um, a set region or place in order to, in order to facilitate communication. So a language which is derived from French and used by African slaves, um, any language which is native to African peoples who have been transplanted, a common language used in dialogue by persons with different native languages, sounds more like it, but any language which is foreign to a speaker who moves to a new um, speech community. That's not it. So I'd say C is the answer for 27, 28, a Caribbean English Creole may be defined as um, a language which is with limited linguistic functions used by the poorest people in society. That's just rude. Understood by some persons in society, not necessarily. Um, developed from contrast between European and African languages. No, that is it. Uh, 28 is D. 29. Which of the following expressions is the process of reduplication evident? Stepsister, I water, a wagwan, chaka chaka house. And this is a repeated question. I think it's on every paper, to be honest. Every paper. Every paper. It's chaka chaka house. Oh, they don't usually add house. I don't remember these things. 30. Which of the following are regarded as official languages of the Netherlandic territories of the Caribbean? What just happened? All right. So the options are Dutch, French, and Portuguese. And Dutch, you know, for a fact, would be one of the answers. So the answer is either A, a B, or D. No, you need to decide between Portuguese and French. No. <laughs> I know about French, but for um, Dutch colonies um, or Dutch territories, I don't know about that Portuguese because Portugal is a whole other country by itself. Portuguese, whole different thing, um, different language, and it's closer to Spanish, to be honest. And uh, I'm not saying that France isn't a separate country. You know, French is a whole other language. But countries like Belgium, which I believe is a Dutch territory, wait, it's independent, so no longer a Dutch ter territory. But it speaks, their, their official languages are Dutch, German, and French, right? So I would go anywhere near that Portuguese for this question. So one and two. So I guess I use a bit of history to help me with this question. But I could be wrong. But I am pretty confident in my answer. Let me just say that. Now let's deal with 31 to 33. Remember, we're dealing with these in sections. Now, um, 10 students from Macintosh High in Jamaica are visiting Cuba to improve their knowledge of Cuban culture. They are being hosted by students from the Jose Marte High School. When the students return to Jamaica in return to school in Jamaica, they will be required to write a report on their experience. Which of the following contexts of communication? best describes the interaction between the two groups of students. Now, English and interacting with Spanish, intercultural, meaning between cultures. So 31B, 
32. Which of the following genres will the report most likely be written? It would either be an exposition, like an essay, or a narrative, but it will not be an argumentative piece. So it's either it's two and three. So C. So any answer with one in it basically is out. So A, B, and D are out. So the answer is C for that one. Number 33. While in Cuba, the students attended a seminar or a seminar. The guest speaker noticed that many of the visitors seemed restless during his presentation, even though he was speaking audibly. That means they could, you know, hear him quite well. So what would the problem be? Which of the following was least likely the to be responsible for, his res for their restlessness? So which of the following would least likely be responsible for um, the student's restlessness or would be the least likely reason why the students not really paid this brother no mind? He was speaking too fast. He was speaking in a monotone. He was using many unfamiliar um, um, words or he complimented his speech with a projected slides. The answer for this is D. He, he complimented his speech with projected slides. Fun fact, C would be referred to as semantic noise. When people are using a bag of big words and you don't know what they mean, so you don't know what they're talking about, but they continue to talk like you know what the hell they're talking about, but you really don't, but you just nod and say, yeah, I get you, so that they can stop talking. So 33D, 34, a student council um, wants to raise awareness about the topic students rights and responsibilities among the student population. The council decided that it was best to use a communication campaign to achieve its aim. It was decided that each day members of the council would speak to students who were lined up awaiting their lunch which um presentation format would be most effective for a student the student council president to use in interacting with the um students no i think you would most likely run to impromptu but um an impromptu is you know delivered in the spur of the moment but at least you'd have some idea of what you're gonna say or whatever extemporaneous is practically the same thing done without any preparation you just come you talk but the difference is extemporaneous is done in more of a conversational fashion i think that you'll be interacting with students in the lunch line i don't think the president needs we call a little speech but they just want to have a little conversation and tell you what we're all about tell you about your rights and your responsibilities Tell you about your rights and your responsibilities so for that i would say 34 is a c 35 in which of the following forms of communication is the communicator both the source and the destination of the message public small group interpersonal or intrapersonal I would go with the intrapersonal. That means you're talking to yourself or, you know, communication with yourself. So you're both the source of the message and you are the destination. That question confused me a bit before I looked at the answers. I'm like, what are you talking about? Now let's do with 36 and 37. Benjamin's friend has a habit of talking directly in his face and touching his hands when she speaks he has decided to have a conversation with her friend about it but um finds himself stuttering and hesitating in ways as such uh i mean and you see before he can share his discomfort with her on this a delicate matter the stuttering and forms of hesitation in Benjamin's speech serve mainly to manage impressions, substitute for words, um, convey a contradiction, or de-establish their relationship. You know, D is not the answer. Not really to convey a contradiction, but the words, uh, I mean, 
you see even the fig the the very common ones that we use like popular ones like like i use like a lot and um those are what we call fillers and they're used to substitute for words 37. Benjamin is con concerned about his friend's vocalics, artifacts, proxemics, or chronemics. Proxemics. Like, you're too close. Take a couple steps back. Please and thank you. That's what's going on there. Um, 38 to 39. Your friend Sandra has to deliver a persuasive speech in class, um, but she is unsure about how to effectively organize her presentation. She's nervous about making a confident delivery. Which of the following organizational methods would be most effective in enhancing um, Sarah's speech? Summary points and examples, research examples and in-text citations, repeating key ideas at strategic points, or um, clearly stated claims and supporting details. Yeah, um, we're going to omit B and the summary points and examples. So I'm torn between research, I'm repeating, sorry, key ideas at strategic points, and D, clearly um, stated um, stated claims and supporting details. That could be helpful, but I would go with C, repeating key ideas at strategic points. And I say this because um, it's seen in a lot of um, persuasive speech um, speeches, like the speech done by um, Mayela Yousafzai, and I think that's her name. She was a Nobel Peace Prize winner, I think from Pakistan. Also, the Martin, the famous Martin Luther King's um, I Have a Dream speech, he, rep he repeats I Have a Dream at um, strategic points to drive his point across and actually, you know, try to persuade us to agreeing with him. Persuade us to, yeah. I think that's the preposition that follows. 39. Which of the following techniques could Sandra use to boost her confidence? when delivering the speech drawing support from audience pacing the room and avoiding eye contact you don't want to do this this will disengage you from your audience read directly from her prepared speech that limits um interaction with your audience so you won't have much people paying attention you don't want to do that looking periodically at her teacher who is grading her that's like the worst thing to do brother don't do it don't do it don't look at your teacher that's quite intimidating. So you want to draw support from the audience, especially your friends will hype you up in the crowd, even when you're doing crap. You, you know you need to get yourself some friends like that. I have a couple friends like that. Like most of my friends are like that, or my close friends are like that. Let's just say that. No, let's deal with what is a 41. I'm tired. I'm wondering if you can tell that I'm tired. Now, which of the following features of nonverbal communication are candidates least likely to display when making an effective presentation at an election rally? Least likely, pay attention to these words, least likely to display. The candidate wave hands in the air, maybe, shouting at the audience, that's so aggressive, but let's see. Embracing a close family member, maybe, smiling at the woman in the audience. Of course, you want, me, you want to let the vote feel so nice or up with a little smile. So I would go with B, shouting at the audience. That sounds quite aggressive and I don't like to be shouted at. Now 41, which of the following verbal communication elements can help candidates at an election rally to effectively get their um, message to the voting population? St statistics and sarcasm. Boring and door rude, door rude to me. Rhetorical questions and um, party symbols, party slogans and emotive language, or um, public service announcements and flyers. At the rally itself, you wouldn't want to go with the flyers. 
probably public service announcement but um those are like the things that you go around in the big car the small cars the big cars it doesn't matter the cars with the big speakers and they're you know um telling you stuff i think that's that what that that's what that is no i'll go with party slogans and emotive language because you want to you know appeal to the people's emotions as well as the party slogans you know they're catchy they know what they, they let people know right off the bat what you're about right and they just have a buzz so you want to jump on that excitement um rhetorical questions and party symbols maybe but i wouldn't choose that no for look at me looking like i'm done but i'm not done we're at 42 43 then 44 and 45 so let's just get these done and we're done you get me so a sixth form class is participating jesus christ a sixth form class is practicing to write expository essays the students are using various features of exposition to guide their writing now, the students' expository essays should typically aim to affect the emotions, recount experiences, present their, the writer's viewpoints, or enlighten and instruct the readers. Expository. You can't be persuasive in your expository pieces. That's like the number one rule. So, affect emotions is a no-no. Recount experiences sound like a narrative. Um, present their writer's viewpoint that's argumentative that sounds argumentative to me no to enlighten and instruct the reader I would say that's like um, presenting facts but what has me um, kind of iffy about it is the instruct the reader part so ultimately I would have chosen C. Or would I? Yeah, I would have. To present the writer's viewpoint. Because instruct sounds still a bit like you're trying to persuade. And that's like a no no. 43. Which of the following is not an organizational strategy that the students should typically use in their um, expository? expository essays narration classification chronological order comparison and contrast narration is the answer for this you don't want to use that but sure classification um chronological order and such seems quite fine now let's go to 44 to 45 all right D Bone Restaurant is found in the hills of Caron Hall. It is nestled in a rustic backyard setting and traditional Caribbean dishes are served for reasonable prices. However, as cheap as it is, it's not worth the long arduous drive. The first sign that this dining experience was heading for a disaster was our being greeted at the door by a flying cockroach. Next was the poorly lit walkway that customers inevitably stumbled through to their tables. Honestly, the seating and ordering, ordering of meals was a fairly smooth process. However, the wait was eternal and when the meal was finally served, it was cold and flat. After suffering through each bite of the food, departure from D-Bone restaurant was welcoming. What a tacky eatery. What's the writer's purpose? What is the writer's purpose given the type of writing used in the extract? To inform and assume, amuse, sorry, it's not to amuse, to inform and persuade, to create a sensory impression by amusing, or to create an impression and to a sensory impression and to enlighten. A sensory impression, by the way, is referring to like, um, uh, a reach to appeal to your senses so like smell taste um hearing well taste yes but you don't want to taste the paper taste touch and um did i say hearing whatever your senses are we have five of them right <laughs> um to persuade and to inform would be mine my answer 45 which of the following types of writing is mainly used in the extract 
narrative, um, academic, expository, or persuasive. It's it's filled with opinions, to be honest. So I would not have gone for academic, nor would I would I have gone for expository. But narrative and persuasive. It's not really narrative. Is it? Like it is, but not. Is it? I hope you're getting what I'm saying. Like it's telling you the events. And uh, all right, let's read this again. So Debon Restaurant is found in the hills of Caron Hall. It is nestled in a rustic backyard setting and traditional Caribbean dishes are served for reasonable prices. However, as cheap as it is, it's not worth the artist's drive. All right, I'm going for persuasive, to be honest. The first sign that this was, like, it tr they're trying to tell you that, hey, like, this place, it, it, it ain't worth it, brother. It ain't worth it. The eating experience was trash. Because the, cool the food was cold and trash. Cold and flat. Oh my god. Cold and flat. And after suffering through each bite, departure was welcoming. That's quite sad. What a tacky eatery. So, um, yeah, for 45, I say persuasive. And I think that's what I chose for my answer anyway. When I did the paper itself. I think I only changed like two answers. Yes. So... I guess we're done so as usual guys if you're hearing this that means you've made it to the end of the video congratulations you know what to do drop a like on this video subscribe to my channel and turn on your post notifications so you know every time i post a new video as as i said if you're not following me on instagram please do me a huge favor and go over to both my instagram pages and follow me on them i'll follow you back on my personal at underscore c-a-m underscore e-o my name is Camille Lee, by the way and on my business page at young underscore genius dot official and have a great day guys until next time and may i remind you that i am going to be dropping content for this um summer period seeing that i'm on a break and of course the well well the first thing that I, that's on the top of my mind is the long awaited q and a my first q and a so that's the main reason why i want you to go follow me on instagram so when i drop that you guys can ask me questions so i can have a um a content filled video for you guys all right so until next time bye uh bye and i guess next year is gonna be lit guys as in next school year <laughs>